Damon, you, you know, one of the things we have to stress is that these are not just adult diseases, these are pediatric diseases. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the adult aspects, but pediatric sarcomas tend to have very well-defined treatment paradigms. How do, how do you approach a patient when they also come in, and how is that a little different from what we spoke about? So I do think that the, uh, the strengths of the pediatric oncology sarcoma community and the strengths of the adult sarcoma oncology community do work well together. And when we have an unusual patient, like say a 60-some-year-old patient who has a neck mass and is ultimately found to have alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, a disease that peaks in the, in the teenage years, um, in, in those kind of cases, um, one could be dogmatic and say this is how we would treat a teenager. However, uh, one who primarily teaches, uh, treats teenagers mm -hmm. doesn't have a really good understanding of how to treat a 61-year-old and, and the, um, how toxicities and tolerabilities scale to okay. that age, age range. And so um, when, uh, when something like that happens, when there's a pediatric cancer happening in an adult, and an advanced, and a, not a young adult, an right. advanced adult. Right. Um, we, I certainly would would have multiple members of our team involved. But th this is when the diagnosis really does matter a ton. And so this went from a small, round, undifferentiated cancer. And we've talked about how heterogeneous the diagnoses are. But within a specific, once you've done all that work, once you've found that small bit of fat that made it a dedifferentiated liposarcoma and not a undifferentiated sarcoma, and once you've once you've you know cinched the diagnosis. Why do some of them that are two centimeters have metastases and grow quickly and, and progress rapidly and others are 47 centimeters and recur 12 years later after a surgery that was marginal? You know, the, 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 the heterogeneity goes beyond the naming of the diagnosis. But within, you asked me about within a, a pediatric kind of cancers, yes, I, I do think that um, uh, the collaborative spirit of pediatric oncology, the idea that uh, all centers will treat the same way through the Children's Oncology Group uh, did lead to significant findings and significant um, or at least cohesive and um, uh, more formulaic treatment of, of pediatric rhabdomyosarcomas than perhaps the way some soft tissue sarcomas are managed in adults. Uh, I think that we have learned things through that method, uh, but I see the same collaborative spirit among sarcoma adult yeah. oncologists, and, and as we continue to break them down into their subtypes, the, I think the same things will be found. Yeah, and I think that's an important point that we'll kind of bring throughout, is that the pediatric sarcomas, even when we see them in, in young adults or adults, they have very well-defined treatment strategies for it, right? And it's very important to make sure that you understand that and tap into those. One of the things that I think we need to get a is what do patients with rare diseases face? What are some of the challenges that they face that, say, patients who have breast cancer or colorectal cancer don't face? So I think, I think it's, it's very complex, and I think you could sort of break our patients down into probably two core groups, and we focus a lot, at least at my center, on the under 39, and the reason is that I think that we really need to push to this adolescent and young adult group. They're walking into waiting rooms with a lot of 65 plus patients. They're not seeing anybody that looks like them. They're being treated in rooms with patients that won't look like them. If they go at age 26 to the children's hospital, they're sitting there in waiting rooms with blocks and games and toys and everything. So I do think it's a very complex group that does need the social workers, it does need the therapists involved, psychosocial oncology involved, that really gets them through. They're also at a point of life. You could be finishing up college, starting your first job. They're dealing with issues of fertility that a lot of the 65 plus doesn't deal with. Um, they're dealing with issues of do, what do they do with respect to their families, getting married, things like that. Young children that probably an older population doesn't have to deal with. And then for the older population, I think there really is a difficult understanding. I think that if you have a tumor in the lung, you think it's lung cancer. If you have a tumor in the liver, you think it's liver cancer. And there really is this difficult concept to grasp what is a sarcoma. No one else they know ever has this. And I think to really show up and have something very rare is very scary. Yeah. Even if the prognosis is very good, it still is this non-entity. They're referred often into an academic center because they're being told by someone they don't know what this is. I've never treated this. I don't know that when we round on patients and everyone says, oh, there's such an exciting case, I would never want to be an exciting case because it's really only exciting for the physicians and never exciting for the patient. And so I think that really is a lot of things they have to deal with. And you show up in a cancer center, I mean, I don't know that we have a ribbon. I don't know that we're giving out cookies. I don't know that we have walks. I don't. I don't think we have these things, and I think they're sort of left 
in this 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 area where they sort of don't fit into very much. And I agree, and there's no information out there. So patients come in often, you know, with six months of misdiagnoses and confusion, and it can be a very difficult journey before you can start on treatment. Or, or worse, they've been Googling it. Yeah. Well, that's and right. then they get scared by what they read because it's not right. in context, right. and they've been in a place where the doctor may say, you're the only one of these I've seen, and I'm going to call a center or, or I'm not. And then it's up to the patient to help navigate their own service. And it's up to us then to reach out to the doctors in our catchment areas, in our community brethren, to say, you know, let's work together. We, we can help you define a plan of action together for this patient. You know, the uterine sarcoma um, world has actually gotten together digitally. There are online support groups and chat rooms of women with leiomyosarcoma particularly, but other kinds of sarcomas. And though that kind of lay information can be dangerous or incorrect, at least they are connected. And there does seem to be a common thread where they say to each other, you need to be in a specialized center. You need to be cared for by someone that knows what they're doing. And I think that that means that referral to academic centers yeah. like we're in is, is increased. Yeah. And that gives us the opportunity to get the, re the correct information out there. That's right. Um, but it's not uncommon that people still arrive in my office and I will sit down to talk to them and the first thing they'll say back to me is, I already know chemotherapy doesn't work in this disease. And I think it's very common that yeah. people think that of, my, of uterine sarcomas, but really all sarcomas. All sarcomas. Yeah. And yet later on, you know, I'm going to be able to say, but we have so many choices <laughs> right. now. Um, right. Because there are, there are drugs that work in these cancers, right. sometimes curably so. That's, um, that's right. And so it's important that people get to where they can hear the right thing. I agree, because once you start on the path, you can empower patients, you can bring in hope, you know, and you can really then allow you know, them to take control again. So. I think it is important to have Peers, like like just like you just hit on the other people who've had similar cancers I especially in the young adult range the patients who are are in that age where they do rely so much on peer supports I've had patients who say not only do I want someone with my diagnosis but also in the left arm you know and also you know in yeah. proximal and like this you know all this was in preferably between eight to ten centimeters you know like you're really detailed but you can find them and, and there are organizations that exist around the country that to do things like that and there are certain things that even the best social worker just can't do because they haven't been there yep. You know, none of us have, have tried out these, these medicines that we give our patients recreationally. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah. it, it takes someone who's been there. I agree.